All right. <laughs> you are listening to Castles and Cryptids, where the castles are haunted and the cryptids are cryptic as fuck. I'm Alana. I'm Kelsey. <laughs> and the hosts are reminiscing about their brief sojourn to a much warmer place. Well, Vegas. <laughs> yeah. I was like, usually much warmer. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we are on episode 48. It's 48. Yeah. Almost Which is 50. crazy. Almost 50. I've been thinking about 50. We we've been thinking about it a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's special. It's coming up. It's pretty exciting that we made it this far. But yeah. Thank you for Almost everyone that is still listening. <laughs> Yes, for sure. <laughs> uh, we love to see it. I don't know. Every time I get a new, we get a new country or, you know, we a country moves up. Billy Kelsey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got a bunch of lessons here for some reason. <laughs> yeah, we don't even, especially when it's in a place we don't even know anybody in. It's just kind of like, how yeah. did you find us? And oh, you're telling a bunch of people about us. <laughs> <laughs> also, why does everybody like, did we ask what it's it almost seems like everybody likes some of the dark episodes, like yeah. Japanese true crime, where we like, I noticed about that child murder and <laughs> gangster crime. <laughs> like, okay. You guys want the dark stuff? Well, we'll bring it on. We got a crime one coming up, so just wait. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Ooh. I still have to pick a case. So <laughs> oh yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's tomorrow's problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. We peek behind the curtain here. We're running a little behind because we well, we had it was hard even with two weeks off. I don't know. Um to like keep up with this. <laughs> And yeah after we got back you know it's like okay well now we gotta research new case and everything starts all over again <laughs> yeah but it's really fun um just usually we like to be like almost like two weeks ahead and right now we're not that's all <laughs> we're, yeah, fine. we're fine right now we're recording this on two days Tuesday. ahead <laughs> We're recording on Tuesday and it's going to be po has to be ready and edited by Thursday at midnight. Yeah, not our usual style. We're a little bit more anal than that, where we like to have some time to like, you never know how long editing is going to take. Okay. That's all we're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. when you talk as long as we do. <laughs> we just have to keep this one really good and literally just make it so that we, other than our little... <laughs> before we do our intro hopefully none of it has to be edited that's the goal yes no mistakes <laughs> one <Yep>. take <laughs> and go oh you get to go um yeah. oh yeah what are we talking about this week there might even be some death i mean we talked uh, about it might not be a crime week but it still could be pretty gruesome so we had talked about doing um well i had pointed out it had been quite a while since we had done a haunted <laughs> objects episode uh so we are doing some haunted objects i think you said divining objects mm -hmm. is that what you called them before <sighs> i did haunted objects but they didn't end up being uh like divining in any way <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I so did many a... to choose from that it was like, oh my god. Okay, what do I want to do? And then kind of as I pick things, then a, a theme kind of emerged. <laughs> okay. Well, I I picked one haunted object because I was lowballing. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, mine. I'm pretty sure almost everybody is going to be familiar with. So my haunted object I chose is, I'm going to be calling them Ouija boards because I'm boring yep. and lame, uh, but some people no. pronounce it Ouija. I don't know. I don't like it. I feel I, like Ouija. that's probably just kind of how it started out. 
and that's how it's yeah. written but over time people have started saying it ouija yeah that, that almost becomes more the accepted pronunciation you know because it's more common On, yeah online just before we started recording i was trying to look it up and i was like looking up correct like correct pronunciation <laughs> and they're like if you live in north america you probably say ouija and if you live yeah. anywhere else you probably say like ouija and i was like okay cool <laughs> thanks right and I, I kind of get it because I kind of know where the name comes from a little bit. But having said that, I ended up turning off half a, or I ended up fast forwarding halfway through one of my favorite podcasts because it became apparent that what they were going to talk about was Ouija boards. And I was like, oh, oh no. no. And that was today. And I was like, uh, <laughs> I'm not going yeah. to listen to this right now because I know what Kelsey's covering and I want to be fresh. <laughs> yes. So I- um. So my entire segment, I guess I'll call it, is brought to you by the Smithsonian website and Reader's Digest for a... I love so it. the Smithsonian like had a bunch of information, like a complete history um, that was backed up by this gentleman who apparently is like a Ouija board. Hold on, let me find him. What do they call him? It's like something weird. Ouijaologist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Where is it? He's a planchette <laughs> aficionado. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he, well, he studies Ouija boards. He's been studying Ouija boards mm. since 1992. And I guess he's well known enough. He goes to like, um, like paranormal conventions. He gets like invited to, to talk about like Ouija boards and their history and like everything. Um, Damn. so he's pretty knowledgeable about it. He's been studying them for like 30 years. Um, so he had a lot of his information was on the Smithsonian website. Um, oh, okay. and then, I have from Reader's Digest, weirdly enough, they had 13 spooky Ouija board stories that'll give you chills. Um, So that's (laughs) what I'll be ending with because they were, some of them were just so terribly corny and I loved it. Hey, Reader's Digest has some good information in it a lot of the time. (laughs) (laughs) And I do like when they have um, little funny anecdotes that they'll include too yeah it's like almost like overheard kind of things or yeah so i love it <laughs> all right uh <laughs> so i have a quote uh the makers of the first talking board asked the board what they should call it and the name ouija came through or ouija and when they asked what it meant the board replied good luck And that was from Robert Murch, that Ouija historian. Oh my God, it was in my first paragraph and I scrolled through all of my notes trying to find out what he was referred to as. Uh, Ah, Ouija historian. Robert Murch, interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I think they were, yeah. If I had heard any more about the Ouija, I was going to hear about that guy because that name came up. Yeah. they said it meant like the voices said it meant good luck because I thought it meant like yes so that's kind of there's a story I'll get to it and it's the story of that like Robert has uncovered that I believe kind of more so than because what we means yes in French and then Mm -hmm. like what what language is ya from I think some of the Nordic ones, like Germanic ones, like German, Swedish, maybe. And then, right, isn't that just yes again? Yeah, exactly. So it's literally yes, yes. And it's like, cool, (laughs) thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's it's my yeah, yeah board. Um, (laughs) We're going to go get my my yeah, yeah board. Uh, (laughs) But there's this different story, um, and it's one that's actually a whole lot cooler um Ooh. yeah okay I don't think I've heard any other origin story for that so that would be interesting well it's like I think I have it in here oh I may have cut it out uh 
so like there's this story i'll just go through it now there's the story about like saying that it said like that its name was ouija or whatever and it said that that meant good luck but there's also things about the first people that used it um and robert like tracked down the daughter that was like sitting at the table when the first like ouija board was being used and her mom was using it and her mom was like literally just wearing a necklace that had a portrait and it had like the lady's name above it it was like kind of one of those cool like kind of like english woman like necklaces where they almost look like they're like um like ivory like the silhouette kind of mm. ones with the face and it was like that right. and it was about this woman that was some kind of historical figure or whatever and her name uh was like o u i uh like g a or something and it could have literally just been like yeah that it was like a mispronunciation or misreading of like the necklace that she was wearing and that she's and that her mom was actually because she was wearing the necklace was like the one that was moving the planchette more than the others oh yeah okay i mean it sounds like a very pretty necklace i'm picturing yeah, yeah like a locket with like you say yeah, some yeah like something like that some they said it would have been like inlaid. a picture of her and then it had her name above it and it was like all part of a necklace and i'm like that sounds like a crazy necklace <laughs> almost like well the, you, you, i can picture a locket and then i can also picture some name necklaces like carrie and sex the city has the carrie necklace or yeah like alexis and Shit's creek wears a necklace that's just an a on a yeah. chain and stuff but like yeah to have them both together you don't always see as often yeah so it was something that's, like that. So that's like an alternative, I guess, way of how the name possibly came about. Hmm. And he, yeah. the the guy there was doing a session with someone that was wearing the necklace? No, he, in like his research as a Ouija board, like historian, tracked down like the people that like did the first production and everything oh, of okay. like the Ouija boards and then how they came to learn about them and like everything like that because right. they didn't actually um they like manufactured them uh but they didn't actually like make them in the first place or like invent them right we'll get into it because it's kind of like a crazy thing um, yeah, it must be yeah i can't wait to hear it <laughs> yeah so this is gonna be it's the smithsonian website they had a good mixture of like historical just like history and kind of like supernaturally stuff but i, I thought like it was kind of cool yeah i just always have a hard time when i go to say it <laughs> I'm the smithsonian like, yes i don't know how many times i've said on the podcast here the smithsonian <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it's a good resource <laughs> yeah it's my only research resource other than reader's digest this week so you're welcome <laughs> Uh, so starting out in February of 1891, the first ads were running for the Ouija board and they started appearing in newspapers. Um, and they were like the headlines read Ouija, the wonderful talking board that answered, quote, questions about the past, present and future with marvelous accuracy and promised Ooh. never failing amusement and recreation for all the classes, as well as a link between the known and unknown, the material and immaterial." End quote. Oh my gosh, it's not promising much, is it? No, nothing at all. <laughs> always works, never fails, always provides amusement, never a yeah. demon or entity <laughs> that you don't want. Oh my God. Um, and the ads for the board were basically the same type of board that's sold today. Um, other than, wow. I guess, the material it's made out of. It was a flat board. It had all the letters of the alphabet and the numbers zero through nine, as well as yes and no in the top corners and goodbye at the bottom. Uh, right. The board came with the planchette, which was a teardrop shaped device that normally didn't always, but sometimes has a hole in it. Um, they kind of view it as like the window so that you can like place it around the letter or number. 
Yeah, I kind of like uh, those ones with the little mm, hole window. Yeah, <laughs> I think the first ones it was more like just pointing at mm. it. That would make and sense, then, especially because like glass and stuff would have been expensive. So yeah, yeah, would have just been a hole. <laughs> So two or more people place their hands on the planchette and then ask the board questions. The board then can answer yes or no, or just spell out the answer. And today the board is normally just cardboard and the planchette is normally plastic. When back in like the 1890s, when it was first in production, uh, and even before that a little bit, uh, it was normally all made out of wood that's cool yeah so it'd be like solid wood board and planchette was used and nice. before the patent for the ouija board was approved in the 1890s the patent office actually um, forced them to like come in and use the board in front of them and they did this um and confirmed with the people at the patent office that it worked and then they approved oh. the patent for a dollar and 50 cents at the time. I didn't look up what oh my God. that would be today. Um, they confirmed then, that it worked. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I talk about it later. I should have reread my notes. Um, but they literally, basically, like Robert tracked down was like, what was this confirmation that they used before they got approval for the patent? Yeah, And it was basically that one of the per like people that owned the toy company that was like making it and looking for the patent um basically just spent like asked the board or the guy who would approve the patent asked them how to spell his last name and his last name was like kind of strange or something i guess and it like the oh, ouija board okay. like they all put their hands on and it spelled his name and then they're like Woo! so they approved the patent so and they're like, oh, well, theoretically, like, like you that. have a meeting with the dude to get a patent in the first place. You probably know how to spell his name. So it was <laughs> I mean, like, that's fair. Not too. great. Yeah. Right. It, it might not be like uh, without a shadow of a doubt, <laughs> definitive proof. <laughs> but then again, it's like, what what is right? Oh, it's like, yeah. you, can't, you can't prove the sasquatch is real but you basically can't prove that he's not real either <laughs> yeah kind of thing. that's funny so um, uh robert Mer the, i have a question yeah you said the company um i think i had heard that it was milton bradley that was the game company is that the one that's trying to patent it or do you know no. if I, I get into it. There's like a bunch of them that oh it pretty oh. much hot potatoed for like 50 years like I see. I get, I'm yeah. just getting ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Robert Murch, uh, as I mentioned before, has been setting the Ouija board since about 1992. And quote, for such an iconic thing that strikes both fear and wonder in American culture, how can no one know where it came from? End quote. The Ouija board was uh, brought about in a time when America was obsessed with spiritualism and the belief that the dead were able to communicate with the living. And this belief came over starting, well, it was really strong in Europe, but it kind of came over more into America starting around 1848, which seems so long ago. It's crazy how old this thing is. Well, um, true. But yeah, it was big. Yeah. I remember hearing that a few times that spiritualism got big in the 1800s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it was big in Europe with the sudden rise of the Fox sisters, uh, as well in New York, mm. starting around eight, 1848. And the Fox sisters claimed to receive messages from spirits um, through them, like banging on the walls in order to answer questions. And they right. did this into, in like many parlors and like locations across New York. So they'd ask a question and then there'd be knocks on the wall. And the sisters' success, along with like press at the time, um, and other spiritualists kind of were starting out. So they really brought the movement to its peak starting in kind of the 1850s onwards. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh so That's spiritualism. <laughs> yeah. Like two sisters. <laughs> That's such an influence. 
whether you believe yeah. them or not. <laughs> yeah. So spiritualism coexisted at the time with Christianity, um, and they actually viewed it as kind of like wholesome, trying to talk and communicate with the dead, and uh, even allowed people to conduct seances to contact loved ones through like automatic writing, where like somebody's just writing, I guess. I don't know much about automatic writing. Um, I know Me more either. about but yeah. I, I have heard of it and so I kind of get that it's like not supposedly you that's doing the writing something yeah through you. yeah um but you see more often and that, that's in like a few movies but I feel like more often you see what's called table turning parties which is when everybody has their hands on the table and it starts shaking and rattling and then it lifts off the floor oh nice. okay that's always a good in the movies. I love it. <laughs> Seances instead of sewing circles and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> they're just, they're this just is our fun. book club. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God, we should start another book club. That was so fun. <laughs> I was talking about it today with uh, my friend Caitlin on the way home from work. <laughs> book clubs are fun, guys. Don't make fun. <laughs> the only books I've read recently are like literally those Black Baker Brotherhood books. Okay. I've I... now figured out I've read 35 of them. <laughs> like, and it's literally the only like proper like full length novels I've basically com read start to finish in like 10 years. They're like the soap opera of novels. <laughs> they keep going on forever. <laughs> oh yeah. She's like released two more spin-off series that are set in the same world and they're just as good and I love them I get it I'm a word nerd but sometimes all I want to read is comforting novels that don't like because you want it as that's an escape. These. yeah yeah that's these um, I love the characters I love the world <laughs> everybody's funny and it's great I've been rereading some Stephen King that I hope they make it into a series because the Mr. Mercedes trilogy is really good and I think would make really good movies like most of his adaptations have made good I think movies. they are I think they are I hope so we might have talked about it in our Stephen King episode we've done yeah, so I think episodes, it's guys <laughs> I think it's set to become like a Netflix thing or something because I remember oh, hearing about so it good. it's yeah I don't know it's like I like a good like murder mystery thriller you know beach read whatever people call it like in the, yeah. yeah yeah I don't know it's more doctor sleep than the shining more modern and mm. stuff so it's it's pretty cool uh, it's interesting that's good yeah I haven't read that one I uh, it's hard for me to read Stephen King I've never liked an ending I'm sorry I'm sorry Stephen King mm, endings are hard doesn't he talk yeah. about that because his one character that's a writer it it has a hard time with endings <laughs> yeah he talks yeah and he talks a lot about you can tell he's been an English teacher in these books because they ref they refer to a lot of like classical novels and stuff but yeah I don't know tangents <laughs> um Ouija so boards. We, yeah back to Ouija boards uh it, they were also popular due to the fact that at the time the lifespan was less than 50 so not great um so oh, that the meant lifespan like, of the average of person people yeah I mean so like people were dying young yeah. so people were like wanting to communicate with loved ones I guess more um, I can see that and then when there's wars and stuff because in America yeah. there would have been it would have been around the civil war or just before yeah maybe. that actually will get yeah. to it in like a sentence <laughs> um so Damn. yeah at the time like lifespan on average is less than 50 uh a oh. bunch of women still do but more so at the time were dying like during childbirth and stuff that probably brings the average way down too yeah you know what I mean because there's probably still um, lots of people that lived past 50 but anyway yeah and then Damn it didn't kids. help that like uh, children were also dying of like a bunch of different diseases and then men on average were like just dying in the war in huge numbers right. and 
so during the Civil War, it was seen the Ouija board was seen as a, or I guess spiritualism in general was seen as a way for people to contact loved ones who had left um, and like left their home to go and help fight and then maybe never returned home and they like didn't know what happened to them exactly or didn't know details. Yeah. Um, And one that the Smithsonian even mentioned um, for like using spiritualism and stuff was actually Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Abraham Lincoln actually did on multiple occasions conduct seances in the white house after her Mm -hmm. and her uh abraham's 11 year old son actually died of a fever in 1862 okay that's sad but that makes sense that that prompted them to have an interest in the afterlife and stuff Mm -hmm. if you remember um Lincoln was the one that that was said to have seen his doppelganger and it was Mary that apparently like told him or whatever that um, because that he had seen his like reflection or something in the mirror or window or something and seen a doppelganger it meant that he would like get reelected but he wouldn't survive the second term or something. Yeah. So they've come up with this spiritualism before so that was kind of interesting holy shit when, what episode did we talk about doppelgangers like, that was that the was very it? first episode oh, okay death omens yeah right? yeah damn that's why it's hard to remember our audio quality has gone much up since much up since then <laughs> is that grammatically correct i don't know <laughs> i don't know and i don't know how to fix it so way up <laughs> audio quality woo <laughs> yeah Speaking, not so much. <laughs> I still suck at that. <laughs> uh, so Robert Murch, uh, I think this is, oh, this is just a couple quotes, says, uh, communicating with the dead was common. It wasn't seen as bizarre or weird. And it's hard, hard to imagine that now we look at that and think, why are you opening the gates of hell? <laughs> like, right? Uh, I don't know how can it how can it also like how can it open the gates of hell and then we also sell it with the board games (laughs) yeah it seems a little weird that it's both (laughs) yeah I don't know so getting into like the first production of the Ouija board um the first company to produce the Ouija board was the Kennard Novelty Company like Kennard um and they actually uh started due to the money that they were expected to make um based on like spiritualism at the time uh so yeah they didn't do it because they believed in it they literally were a hundred percent in it for money um people were desperate for an easier way to reach the spirits and rather than like trying to contact people like the fox sisters and wait for like knocks on the wall um so they would basically I think what they were like talking about is like you would they would literally knock on the wall on like you would say the alphabet so you'd be like trying to spell out a word so you'd be like going like a b c d and you would hear a knock on the wall and then you'd stop and then write it down and then like go to the and then go back a b c oh, and then yeah. every knock and you'd be like spelling out the answer that way right so and this that's was how seen, the fox sisters supposedly communicated with them my understanding yeah without like diving in or looking up anything but that seemed to be kind of what the article was implying okay yeah so this like the ouija board was seen as like a very easier thing than like Mm -hmm. trying to go through the alphabet yourself it's literally just going directly to a letter or going yes or no it's Um, like the difference between when you the phones first came out and to text you had the t9 thing so i my first phone you had to go abc if you wanted to get to see yeah it was terrible versus like now you can just (laughs) type in on a keyboard on your screen (laughs) I also liked that in the Smithsonian article it said that people at the time were used to having things very quick because of their communication through telegraphs (laughs) and I was like oh god so it was like yes they wanted answers quicker because they were used to answers through telegraphs and I was like oh my god they thought that was quick 
Yeah, and if that telegraph took three minutes to load, oh boy, they got pissed. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, oh, this is great. I love it. <laughs> oh, that's amusing. Telegraphs. Mm -hmm. And isn't that like you're doing Morse code? <laughs> yeah, right? That's what I thought. But I was like, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, so, like, this idea of, like, telegraphs and, like, having a way... I guess that it could be written and you doing it yourself rather than having to pay somebody to do it on a regular basis for you really helped the Ouija board and allowed it to like just spread like wildfire in popularity. And Which is interesting because they only get your money once if they do that, right? Yeah. You buy the Ouija board. Whereas if you're like a psychic or someone, and and they kind of sound like the bad kind of psychics where like they're like oh i just people are, these people are grieving i'm going to take advantage by being like you can talk to your dead loved one or you know i but i'm the only one that can help you with that <laughs> yeah i i mention it in a little bit but let's just say that like people like psychics and stuff did not like the ouija board and then they kind of changed their right. minds so Ooh. Yeah. So in 1886, after reading reports of the talking board uh, that were coming out of Ohio, Charles Kennard um, of the Kennard Novelty Company brought together a group of investors in 1890 and started the Kennard not or er, this says Kennedy. Maybe it was the Kennard. That's a typo. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah it should be the Probably. Kennard novelty company because I'm like I'm pretty sure it was his last name um <laughs> and they actually made this company and the only product that they sold was mass producing the Ouija board that's all they did yeah was so they were all? and yeah that's okay. all that was like mentioned I didn't look up like specifically what they sold but it said that uh they started this company solely on the intents and purposes of getting the Ouija board, like rights and patent, and then putting it into mass production. Wow. Yeah. They're like, get one in every home. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have like a whole, just like, I have quite a few, but there's like paragraphs where I literally just quoted directly from the Smithsonian um, mm -hmm. article. So this is, next section is basically just what they have written. Um, it said, according to Merch's interviews with the descendants of the Ouija founders and the original Ouija patent file itself, which he's seen, the story of the board's patent request was true. Knowing that if they, oh, this is where I talked about it. Knowing that if they couldn't prove that the board worked, they wouldn't get their patent, Bond brought the indispensable Peters to the patent office in Washington with him when he filed his application. There, the chief patent officer demanded a demonstration. If the board could accurately spell out his name, which was supposed to be unknown to Bond and Peters, he'd allow the patent application to proceed. They all sat down, communed with the spirits, and the planchette faithfully spelled out the patent officer's names. Whether or not it was mystical spirits or the fact that Bond, as a patent attorney, may have just known the man's name, well, that's unclear, Merch says. But on February 10th, 1891, a white-faced and visibly shaken patent officer awarded Bond a patent for his new, quote, game or toy. And uh, that was the end from the Smithsonian article. And then I put the patent offered no explanation as to how the board worked, which only ended up adding to, like, the public's intrigue because there was no, like, description about it. Well, of course yeah. not but also yeah. that part does sound familiar about the little story because I always yeah. notice when somebody has my same name and there was a Peters in that story yeah yeah I think <laughs> Peters was cute. just one of the guys that like uh was one of the investors right probably I cut out a bunch of names because there was a lot going on oh for sure I mean I've heard entire multi-part episodes about like the spiritualism movement and some of the yeah. like famous people that were involved in it like harry houdini and stuff it's pretty crazy mm -hmm. we could definitely do a like i love yeah. this deep dive i love this kind of stuff it's so cool 
<laughs> yeah, I'm like, I thought this was pretty interesting. I didn't expect the Ouija board to be this old for like anything. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of just you take it for granted, right? It's like shit that's yeah. been around for ages. <laughs> yeah. So the rights and the title as investor of the Ouija board uh, were kind of fought off and on in local papers with members of the company coming and going over the years. Um, there's like a huge story like about it. They basically are like everybody's constantly arguing about who actually invented the Ouija board and who actually owned the rights and like all this stuff. And really, even the Kennard Novelty Company read about it from like newspaper reports in Ohio and it was already a thing they just made it and then they actually like entered the patent thing to be yeah. able to produce it um so they didn't even invent it anyway right um so just jumping ahead to because I thought it was like the next most interesting like section was 1919 um that's when the remaining business interests were actually sold to a William Fold for just a dollar and oh gosh yeah so the company had basically like changed hands a bunch of times um and then the last like original guy ended up selling his stuff over to William Fold for a dollar in 1919 and while many spiritualists initially bought the boards uh spirit mediums tended to dislike the board as it took away from their business and income as you kind of talked about um, but then after kind of feeling this okay. way, they actually realized that they too could use the board as a tool themselves and that maybe it would make the public trust them a little bit more because they too might be familiar with Ouija boards. And so. this is people that are like mediums. As yeah. I, I always get mediums, psychics, whatever, same sort of deal. Okay. Yeah, and the article that it said spirit sense. mediums. Yeah, so yeah. they too, like, even though they were against it at first, they realized, like, I can use this as a tool too, like, stuff. So right. they kind of changed their minds. I'm sure there's still people that hate it, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's people that there's probably real life mediums that hate, like, shows like the Long Island Medium. And I'm sure yeah. I've heard some of them say that because they're like, well, that doesn't help give us uh, credence or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's My interesting. Mom I I think yeah. it probably would make the public maybe like more open to it to see yeah other things yeah uh so the Ouija board offered people of all ages a fun way uh to believe in something and <laughs> just like uh like afterlife and all that kind of stuff got people I guess like talking about it and more open to the idea if they didn't believe in that before Mm -hmm. And the board kind of saw like surges in sales um, at different times. And it kind of seems to be when things are going poorly in the world and in like America and stuff that they see huge surges in sales. So That's they saw grim, but makes kind yeah. of sense. <laughs> um, so they saw huge sales it surges it during World War One and during the Prohibition. Oh, as God. well as <laughs> yeah there was one of the bigger surges during the great depression and um during that time the in a five month period one of the locations like one store that the fold company was operating out of and selling the ouija boards out of in five months that one location sold fifty thousand. Ouija boards during in the Great one, Depression. In one month? In five months. I'm so they so sold sorry. 10, one store sold 10,000 boards a month for five months straight during the Great Depression when people didn't have a lot of money to begin with. Oh my God. Yeah, that'd um, be a lot nowadays with like online sales too. You would yeah. think that would still be a huge number. So this led to like the Fold Company even actually building more factories to keep up with the demand during the Great Depression. Um, and then jumping ahead in 1967, after the Parker brothers bought um, the rights and the production, everything from Fold, um, from the Fold company, okay. that year in 1967, the Ouija board outsold Monopoly with 2 million boards being sold 
in a oh year. Oh my god. In 1967, like imagine two million. Yeah, you had some monopoly. <laughs> And then I Fuck sat you, here Park going, Place. <laughs> well, and then I sat here going, oh my God, Monopoly is that old too? And then it was, yeah, it's so old. Although, I didn't realize it was that old. Right. So wait, did, which one did we say was older than Ouija boards? Yeah. Or... Well, I don't know when Monopoly boards. Oh, were right. Started. But yeah, holy mm -hmm. shit. Old. <laughs> yeah. That's um, so funny. So stories of people solving crimes or finding missing persons also helped make the Ouija board more popular. Um, this was like another huge quote just from the Smithsonian article because it was just a collection of like stuff. Mm -hmm. It said in 1921, the New York Times reported that a Chicago woman being sent to a psych psychiatric psychiatric hospital tried to explain to doctors that she wasn't suffering from mania but that Ouija spirits had told her to leave her mother's dead body in the living room for 15 days before burying her in the backyard okay oh yeah but and why <laughs> I know in 1930 newspaper readers thrilled to accounts of two women in Buffalo New York who'd murdered another woman, supposedly on the encouragement of the Ouija board messages. Oh in, my god. Yeah. In That's 1941. Specific. In 1941, <laughs> a 23-year-old gas station attendant from New Jersey told the New York Times that he joined the army because the Ouija board told him to. And well, that's less violent. Yeah. No, way. these are just like random things that like were newspaper articles. Uh, in 1950, the, they're all over the board. <laughs> yeah. Oh. In 1958, a Connecticut court decided not to honor the Ouija board will of Miss Helen Dow Peck, who left only a thousand dollars to two former servant servants, but an insane one hundred and fifty-two thousand to dollars to Mr. John Gale Forbes, a lucky but bodiless spirit who'd contacted her via the Ouija board. That was my favorite. No, honey. What? $152,000. How does she know that's a bodiless spirit and not some guy's actual name? And he's like, okay, now I can go cash that check because 1900s or whatever security <laughs> measures. Yeah, in 1958 um yeah. so that was like the end of their little list thing um and then they had like a whole section about it i didn't really think it was super interesting but just that like ouija boards at the time were also being written about in like poems and books mm -hmm. um and stuff like that so like i didn't really want to get through examples because i didn't think they'd be super interesting right um, but it made its yeah. way into pop culture yeah mm -hmm. so the perception of ouija boards changed drastically in can you guess I have a feeling you could probably guess the 1970s yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh specifically 1973 with the release of the movie the, the exorcist, exorcist. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Uh, yeah. we're getting good at this <laughs> uh, yeah that, i heard that has a big impact on all yeah. of the occult shit <laughs> um yeah so with the release of the movie the exorcist which depicts a 13 year old girl being possessed by a demon after playing with the ouija board by herself because you're not supposed to do that oh um, my god it's right in the movie okay yeah i literally have like not seen it in a long time <laughs> i think i watched it one time at a sleepover and i was not paying attention um, right yeah we are just terrible. like it was so it was i don't know i was probably watching it when i was like 13 or 14 at like because i one of my oh, birthday parties was like yeah. a horror movie like movie night and we basically oh, turned off the exorcist we turned off one of the like sequels to silence of the lambs sorry um even though like hannibal lecter is like my favorite um, I couldn't yeah. sit through like one of the movies and then like, like 13 another movie 
I think it's maybe the age too. It's hard to also like just focus and like kids. You're still a kid and they want to talk and like that's that's a lot of those are heavy yeah. shit and i'm like oh movies from the 1970s i'm like i feel like i should watch them just to be like okay i did see the exorcist right yeah. but then i'm like at the same time you're like you see all the things from it and the meat and you're like i yeah. already know what happened so yeah i forgot there was even ouija boards in it yeah i didn't know um but she becomes possessed because she plays with it by herself that's basically the start of the movie um, at least you guys movie... didn't do that during your sleepover <laughs> yeah no no ouija boards i've never uh, owned this... one i never have either no um i would definitely own a cool old one i would definitely buy a cool yeah. old one but i would never use it yeah okay yeah um so this movie changed how people saw <laughs> don't buy me a cursed one uh <laughs> So this movie changed how people saw kind of the game board. Um, and Robert Merch says, quote, it's kind of like psycho. No one was afraid of showers until that scene. It's a clear mm -hmm. line. <laughs> That's true. Um, That's very true. I and mean, he said this while explaining that before <laughs> The Exorcist, films and TV depictions of the Ouija board were usually kind of jokey, hokey, and silly. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, just the, I don't know. I was gonna say even most of the horror movies up until then were were as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Other than um, Psycho. <laughs> yeah. Virtually overnight, the board became seen as a tool of the devil, and horror movies and writers, like book writers, kind of latched onto it. Uh, right. People began burning Ouija boards in bonfires, and Merch says that when he first began speaking at paranormal conventions, he was even asked to leave any antique Ouija boards at home because they were scaring people too much. This is up at paranormal conventions. You're scaring people what? at paranormal conventions with old Ouija boards. That's intense. Like, wow. Yeah, they must have a bad energy. Um... My favorite thing is, is a 1991 Hasbro that had purchased the Parker Brothers like company um, was still, I love that it was Hasbro, was still selling hundreds of thousands of Ouija boards, but people were buying them for the spooky and kind of dangerous association rather than to use them as like actually like a spiritual reason or like contacting loved ones right it seems like nowadays people more just use them to see if they can contact anything rather than yeah specifically a good person that they knew which is not yeah. great <laughs> yeah so ouija boards have begun to like become popular again due to movies such as paranormal activity and as well as their use in tv shows i don't remember this but apparently a ouija board is used at some point point in Breaking Bad. I do not remember that at all. I didn't see all of it, so I wouldn't remember either, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't as seem well like as... it would fit with that show. <laughs> no. I do Making not drugs. So many yeah. spirits. <laughs> I remember them liquefying a person in a bathtub. I do not remember the Ouija board. Uh... Oh god, were they trying to contact that person after he was haunting them? <laughs> I don't Jesus. know. <laughs> um, and then apparently Ouija Ugh. boards were also used in other TV shows like Castle and then probably many supernatural oh. type TV shows. Um, new versions, hmm. I believe still by Hasbro, uh, are being made such as ones that glow in the dark as well as um, like Ooh. app companies having like apps on your phone that have kind of re-envisioned the board in a modern time and that you can basically use it as the same thing, but it's on your phone. I don't know how that works with you and the planchette, but okay. <laughs> well, if they can get confusing. like a D and D app where like, you're like, click the thing and it rolls the dice for you. I mean, I guess, but yeah, it yeah. seems like it would defeat the whole purpose. It's like, yeah, it's like to hate just three people to touch my iPhone screen. <laughs> Just one finger, fingertips. though. Yeah. Just fingertips, three fingertips <laughs> smearing up my iPhone screen. No thanks. Except for those girls with the really long nails, they can't even touch their screens. Yeah. So they just be like nails. Yeah, they're no, just but... tap, 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 tap. <laughs> uh, 
don't know if you ever saw them, but I used to hate they would make like the mini versions of board games that were like keychain size. And it'd be like keychain size clue. And I'm like, okay, I love clue and I love many things, but what the fuck am I gonna do with this tiny little clue board that like I liked the travel ones yeah. that were like the size of like a book that you could still like fold out and use. Okay, but that sounds still playable. This one yeah. I'm talking, they like literally were not functional because you didn't have a tiny deck of clue cards to go with it. Oh <laughs> so it was God. just like this tiny little board that didn't have any like pieces or anything. And it was like, well, what the fuck is the point of this? <laughs> Just terrible look, like yeah just to be a keychain whatever um uh one thing which i wanted to mention that was really cool and i'm so happy it was in the smithsonian's article <laughs> it's a little bit about how ouija boards actually work so sorry um oh, okay <laughs> But it's very cool because they're actually using them for like scientific research, um, which is very oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, and I did not know <laughs> anything about this. So the Ouija board is being used by scientists to study the conscious and unconscious and non-conscious thought process and the mind throughout through the ide- ideomotor. I think that's how you pronounce it, ideomotor effect, um, which is they call. Okay. Um, The effect where your body is moving is actually like unconsciously moving an object due to the subconscious will. So like you're actually making it move. So that's what they believe is actually causing the planchette to move. And that researchers proved this by placing a blindfolded participant at a table with another person and not knowing that this other person was involved in the research. They weren't uh, like volunteer. And that as soon as they were blindfolded, the basically the other researcher took their hands like off the table and they thought their hands were still on the planchette. So this person okay. thinks they're, they're playing with another person. They're really mm-hmm. only doing it themselves. And they were asked to use the Ouija board to answer trivia questions, basically yes or no questions only um, from what I understood. And the blindfolded participant was not aware that the other person had removed their hands before the questions had even started and participants in the control group on an average who were just asked the trivia questions and if they didn't know were had been just told just guess you have a 50 50 chance just guess they were basically getting 50 percent right because it's yes or no like you have a 50 percent chance of being right Right, probably. But the people <laughs> who were blindfolded asked the questions and were told to move the planchette with the other partner, who they right. also assume was trying to answer the question at the same time. Mm-hmm. So you'd assume if you didn't know that that person would know. So you're putting more partner. faith in that person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they had a 65% accuracy when they were quote unquote playing with the planchette and the other person, even though it was still just them. Oh my yeah. gosh, so higher accuracy. Because they believed guessing. that the board was telling them the answer or the other person was moving the answer. So they had it's a higher so accuracy. Weird. It's like, what if you're yeah. just like unlocking your, what is it? Locking into your like intuition. That's potential. what it is. <laughs> um, They basically say that the non-conscious mind when you're playing or like using a Ouija board, your non-conscious mind is basically answering the questions for you and uh-huh. you believe it's the board. I can um, see that. So oh, the yeah. results of this test have been like re- replicated in different situations over like different times. Um, they've also used like robots in another room. Um. So like the person's told, oh yeah, like th- it didn't really make sense this one, but the person's like add a thing and they're like, yeah, another person's like in a different room playing with you. And then we're going to see if you see- have the right, the same answer or something. And it's like a robot. It was confusing. I didn't really understand that study. Hmm. Um, this one made more sense similar. where the person was just like, yeah. just taking but it was the same results if they asked them to guess by themselves it was 50 percent. Right. if they were told to guess using the board basically and the board was quote-unquote telling them the answer um it was basically 65 percent right right um, they believed they had some sort of outside influence in yeah. those second studies that's interesting yeah. it's kind of like the placebo effect of yeah. if you're like you think you're taking a drug but you're just 
taking a sugar pill you placebo yeah. effect means you can sometimes still feel like you're taking that drug it's crazy <laughs> Um, so researchers explained that the non-conscious mind of an individual is more knowledgeable than most people actually realize, and that mm -hmm. allowing the person to believe that the Ouija board is giving them the answer allows that person's non-conscious mind to answer for them because it actually may know the answer. Um, it's like I base it as, as having like when you're trying to think of like a word and you keep saying it's on the tip of my tongue, it's on the tip of my tongue. Well, obviously, you know that word just like consciously at that moment you can't sure. access it um it also reminds me of those things like when someone's like what give me your first answer without thinking about it like do you want to do this or this yeah. like phoebe does it to joey on friends and then like the first thing you say is what you clearly want yeah because you don't have to think about it yeah. quite often yeah yeah um so, cool. so the reason why you may think they're just doing this to be annoying for all the people who like are super into spiritualism and think they're just trying to bash on the Ouija board they're actually not um they're actually hoping to use these findings to better understand how the mind works and how neurogenerative diseases like Alzheimer's actually affect the mind um oh, wow. yeah and like if they can figure out how to actually access like the non-conscious mind they may be able to help people with like Alzheimer's and memory problems, um, which would wow. be very beneficial. Um, they have run into some problems with funding, however, as the protocols for using a Ouija board as a method of research isn't really viewed as like impartial or <laughs> it's kind <laughs> of viewed say. as like hokey or out there. Um, <laughs> a little but bit that woo -woo. <laughs> Yeah, got the woo woo. Um, but they are hoping like the that, <laughs> uh, like crowdfunding and stuff online will help them continue their work, Nice, which nice. would be cool. Cause I think if that's like the case, um, and it's somebody's mind, like influencing them and they're not aware of it, it's definitely like worth more research. Cause that's a very yeah. cool, like phenomenon. And if it helps people with like Alzheimer's and stuff, that would be amazing right and you would hope and that's the thing about most research you hope that it's going to be used for the good of something yeah. and not like to brainwash someone <laughs> or something yeah. like that Ugh. yeah um so that brings me to the reader's digest 13 spooky wee ouija board stories that will give you chills yeah some of them i i didn't <laughs> cut any of them out but some of them are in my opinion stupid um really okay well i just kept them all because they're all pretty short so uh, maybe um, it's because people that read readers digest are probably <laughs> old yeah. i was like oh my god hey. why did this link yeah. take me to readers digest <laughs> and not like buzzfeed <laughs> like, the, yeah. the clearly more reputable source <laughs> yeah. Where at least I can scroll down and people are like voting on whether it's a fail or an LOL. <laughs> That's I mean, my favorite I, thing ever. When I watch that bar what? graph and I'm like, yeah, so many fail. Because oh you God, can like vote on the article. That stuff on BuzzFeed actually. I know oh, what I you love mean. It. It's down by the comments. Yeah. 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 I always look at it and I'm like, eh. Every yeah. time it's in fail, I'm just like, yes. <laughs> um, shit, I was going to say something. What, did, what were we just saying before that? Um, oh, it's weird. I've never run across like a Reader's Digest article online, I don't think. Like I've I read haven't the either. copies. <laughs> That's yeah. why I was like, oh, and it took me to one website that was like RD something. And I was like, what? And it took me like two minutes to figure out it was Reader's Digest. Because <laughs> nothing said Reader's Digest. It just kept saying RD everywhere. You're like, I'm okay. waiting for the J, Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna tell me 13 spooky Ouija board stories. Um, <laughs> nice. So the first one, and these will all just be verbatim because they're stories. Uh this one's entitled okay. Text. It says Ooh. Justin played with the Ouija board one day with several of his friends. They asked questions, but instead of the planchette moving to certain letters, it began to move in a strange pattern. It went to all four corners of the board and made an X. The 30, 
two-year-old New Jersey resident tells Reader's Digest, then it just went in circles. The next time we used the board, it was a, at a different friend, or it was with a different friend at his house. Again, the planchette moved in the same strange pattern. It felt like it was some kind of hex, he continues. Later that night when he was sleeping, he felt a forceful hand grab his arm and wake him up, but everyone else in the house was sound asleep. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, that's weird. It doing patterns. Yeah. I haven't heard that too often, but yeah, that's where that one ends. <laughs> yeah. All of these are really okay. short and end so abruptly. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like a Reader's Digest write-in. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, here's four, here's four lines. Uh, <laughs> the next one's called A Ghastly Glitch. That's hard to say. Uh, Abby <laughs> was in her room one night after playing with a Ouija board earlier that day. As she was getting ready for bed, her computer screen changed from black to blue. It turned on by itself. She turned the computer off. Again, the computer clicked itself back to life. Anxious, Abby unplugged the computer completely, and then the unpowered computer started back up again. She buried the Ouija board in her backyard that same night. Oh, she buried it? Yeah, she like dug a hole and buried the Ouija board that night. Interesting. <sighs> the do you know what that reminds me of? I was just, I thought about this a little bit earlier, but one of the pods or whatever we're friends with on our Instagram. Yeah. Um, well, it's, she has a YouTube channel called Mysteries of the Past and Present. Um, her name is Abby. <laughs> just like <laughs> the story. And I remember watching a video where she was like, and this Ouija board we found when we were investigating near the cemetery. It was like in the woods. She found like no. a Ouija board in the woods. <laughs> if you ever get me a Ouija board, don't let it be one you found in the woods near the cemetery. <laughs> no, I can't. I wouldn't take that home, I don't think. Couldn't no. do it. But it's just so funny that you told that story and it was like, wait, who did this? What? And then they yeah. buried it. <laughs> Oh my god, too funny. Uh, the next one is just entitled Solo Play. <laughs> Regretful name. Uh, <laughs> Double entendre. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, most people play with a Ouija board in groups or at least with one other person. But Oceana? Oceana? Okay. Uh, wanted to try to use it on her own. She put her hands on the pointer and asked questions, but nothing happened. She took her hands off the pointer and was about to put the game away when the planchette began to move around it on its own. I'll never try that again, says the 30-year-old from New Jersey. Cool. Thanks. Gross. <laughs> that would be terrifying, though. Yeah. You just like leave it and it starts moving. I don't know. It's just like imagine you just leave your computer and your mouse starts moving on its own or something. It's like, nope, no thanks. Yeah. Ugh. Um solo play. <laughs> oh, this one is actually kind of creepy. Um, it's slightly longer. It says when Vince, now 30, was a child, one of his friends goaded him into playing with a Ouija board in his basement. Young Vince didn't expect anything out, the, out of the ordinary to happen, so he went along with it. Once they started to play, however, the lights began to flicker, the air around them grew cold, and the spirit began to communicate with them through the board. Excuse me. The spirit spelled out a Russian name and claimed he had been murdered. Uh, we took a break to make some pizza rolls, Vince says. Nice. <laughs> but we forgot to close the circle when we were done. After returning to the basement, the energy was much heavier and books and things were sprawled out on the floor. And yet the board remained perfectly still in the center of the room, just how they had left it. Upon looking at the mirror that we had nearby, the eye of the Ouija board was moving sporadically in its reflection. Isn't that creepy? The eye of the Ouija board was moving yeah. in the reflection of the mirror? yeah so like the one he was oh. looking at was fine but the one in the reflection was moving 
because they have what like a uh, eye in a triangle yeah. on the top right i think mo- yeah yeah that like oh nope yeah that one's kind of <laughs> creepy yeah yeah i found a few of them kind of creepy <laughs> Uh, this one's a haunted housewarming the first night I used a Ouija board I was about six or seven and I was with my mom and older sister who was about 15 at the time Paige now 24 tells readers digest the family had just moved into a new house much bigger and much older than the one they lived in previously that night Paige her mother and her sister were eating pizza not pizza rolls but pizza on the living room floor since they didn't have all their furniture set up yet uh, they put on a fire to ease the chill of the fall air. After dinner, the sister pushed her mom to let them play with their old Ouija board. As we were using it, Paige recounts a box in the living room that had some books in it literally flew across the room. Shortly after that, the fire inexplicably went out and their mother was so shaken she took the girls to their grandmother's house to spend the night. Holy shit. Well, when things are flying out at you, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be a little freaky. Jesus. Uh, the next one is summer camp scare. <laughs> this one's <laughs> hard. Ouija board stories don't necessarily t- have to involve the professionally packaged toy. As a child, Liam went, was at a summer camp one year when he and some other boys drew their own Ouija board on a large sheet of paper. As soon as we started using it, he says, we heard knocking coming from inside one of the lockers. And that's where it ends. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> we heard knocking coming. So maybe the ending was cool. that. Yeah. It was, a ghost ate them all, or it was one of the other campers. <laughs> yeah, a kid that got locked in the locker because he's a nerd. No. Um, <laughs> I have heard of people drawing summer. their own, though. Like I never have the word. or whatever is handy. Yeah. I don't know. Just mm. on a podcast and stuff. I think I heard somebody say they did it. And I was like, oh. Creepy. Okay. Um, <laughs> Desperate. The next one is blackout. There are times in all our lives when we question if something is really a coincidence or if it is, in fact, much more meaningful when Becky with an I and two K's used a Ouija board <laughs> during her first semester in college. She had one of those experiences. A few minutes in, we lost power and some car hit a pole on her street. That's probably why you lost power. The timing was strange, she says, to say the least. <laughs> and that's the end of that one. Yeah. I'm, her name is Becky with an I. I'm picturing how I write like Brecky when I'm saying like breakfast. Brecky. Yeah, it's <laughs> B-E-K-K-I, Becky. Oh God, Becky. Becky's a stripper. It's Becky with two K's and an I. It's Becky with the good hair. <laughs> uh, the next one is entitled "Deadbeat Dad." Um, oh. It says Owen started playing with Ouija boards when he was a child, and he has continued to experience paranormal phenomena ever since. My grandfather on my dad's side died before I was born, says the 24-year-old Ohio native. He and my dad were estranged, so my dad never spoke of him or had pictures of him around. And so this is his dad and his grandfather. Owen began seeing and talking to a person he called Michael. Unbeknownst to him, Michael was his grandfather's name. Finally, my parents sat me down, showed me a picture of a man that I had never seen, and asked me if I knew who it was. I told them it was Michael and that he was there with us right then. That's yeah, that's like when we did the past lives. You know, yeah. The things that kids say and you're just like, oh God. No. Oh no. I don't uh, want to know who's right beside me. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The next one's title is very misleading. Uh, it's called Flamethrower. <laughs> says be warned some Ouija board stories can be violent when Anna was in high school she had a sleepover with a bunch of her friends one of them Brianna wanted to use the Ouija board to contact her grandfather who had recently passed away the friends set up the board turned off the lights and lit a candle they called upon the spirit of the grandfather but when they did this the candle suddenly threw itself directly at Anna 
and she felt it was probably not the spirit they had called for. Well, so, unless your grandfather really didn't like you. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm finally at peace. Get out of here. <laughs> Get off my grave. <laughs> gotcha. Um wow. there's only a couple left. Uh the next one's called Blast from the Past. I saw a full-bodied apparition, Glenn 29 from Pennsylvania, says of his experience with a Ouija board. The apparition apparition he saw was that of a young girl wearing what looked like commoner's clothing from an antique era. He told the story to his neighbors, who happened to be historians, and they told him that a little girl just like the one he had described, used to live in the house. And the apparition ended up being a 10-year-old girl named Annalise who died of ter tuberculosis sometime in the late 1800s. It's kind of cool. Holy shit. Also, Annalise, that's one of the, that's like a possession case. There was Annalise Michelle. Oh, yeah. I can't remember if we covered her, question mark. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But. I don't think so. I think probably it was too dark. We did an exorcism episode, and that's probably the darkest one I can think of is that one. Yeah. But yeah, that's just interesting that the name is the same. It's not very common. No. Hmm. Uh, the next one's called Delayed Reaction. Okay. Uh, so one evening when she was in high school, Sherry decided to use a Ouija board with her friends. Nothing seemed to happen, so they all just gave up. Uh, what they would discover later is that the Ouija board actually did work. Weird stuff happened in the house ever since that night, and to this day it hasn't stopped, says the 29-year-old oh, Iowa resident. We've had glasses move right across the table by themselves. I saw a spoon and a cup of coffee aggressively stir in the cup without anyone being near it. <laughs> it's, just a ghost. it's just a ghost trying to make you coffee in the morning. It's like, I'm tired. <laughs> She's been stirring the sugar. Um, really bothered sound, me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the sound of footsteps leading upstairs down into the living room entrance never stopped. That's creepy. Um, Ew. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I thought I had to burp. I was just... <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, two left. Second last one <laughs> is called Dorm Hall Morgue. Ooh. When Tommy was a freshman in college, he and his dorm mates took out a Ouija board and had a threatening encounter with some very dark spirits. The dorm hall used to be a morgue, says the 25-year-old New Yorker. It was the perfect setting for a goof with friends, he oh. thought, but they failed to realize how serious it could get. The planchette oh began God. to move on the board and the spirits or spirits communicated to them that 83 demons would come after them. The next thing you know, okay. the dorm is haunted. I love this. <laughs> 83 <laughs> demons are going to come for them. The next thing you know, the dorm is haunted and the girls can't sleep because stuff is turning on and off and messing with them. So they had a priest come in and bless the room. It was good afterwards, he says. And that's why I don't mess with Ouija boards anymore. Right. I was like, I'm sorry. Is there 83 like students overall? Like, where are they getting this number? Wow. Yeah that's specific um, and terrifying <laughs> the last one this one's kind of great uh it's called when heads roll okay. so okay. randy learned what a ouija <laughs> board was the hard way when two of his family members introduced him to one when they were all children my brother and cousin were older than us the 36 year old michigan or said the 36 year old michigan resident this particular time they had come with a ouija board we agreed to play and to turn off the lights and light a candle. Randy sat down with his favorite doll, Kelly, at his side, nervously waiting in the dark. We started playing and asking questions, and before we knew it, the planchette started moving around in a pointed direction. It traveled the board, dragging itself to the letter K, and when it made or, and then it made its way to E and L. For a moment it paused then quickly circled back around for another l before finally landing on y oh. um, next thing you know there was a loud bang against the radiator and everyone started screaming randy recounts we turned on the lights and by the radiator was the severed head of my favorite doll 
<laughs> and his <laughs> and if you didn't remember his doll's name was Kelly and that's what the Ouija board spelled. I see. I was yeah. like Dun, dun, dun. It was Kelly and uh, wait, I was waiting. And for his kill. name's Randy. <laughs> yeah, oh it's spelling Kelly God. and his name's Randy. But his favorite doll's name was Kelly. But it decapitated his doll. Yeah, that I was the last it. story. <laughs> I'm like, thank you, readers. Digest. I love it. I love it. Yeah. But what if they, they get the name great. wrong? What if they just spell one name wrong? What if they just get one letter off? I mean, I don't know. What how if many they spell I... Becky's name wrong? What Becky. if they spell Becky? without two k's and an i she's like that's not my name <laughs> all the different spellings of megan no but i don't know how many oh. times i'll be like going to say like maybe i'll go to say kelsey but then i have a friend named kelly and it, usually it's probably the other way around because i hang out with you more often mm. so <laughs> i'll probably say kelsey when i mean to say kelly yeah <laughs> and like that shit can happen and it's just like <laughs> yeah. imagine just quickly it could become so morbid oh that was great <laughs> that's a, a history and some information about ouija boards i like it they're pretty I, cool yeah and that's a fun one because it's it does have a pretty big history and facts and yeah you know yeah it's not just like one supposed haunted object because i might have a few of those <laughs> yeah yeah, it's like a whole like collection of them. Like I don't think oh, anybody yeah. just like looks at a Ouija board and doesn't in their back of my their head be like, I could possibly get haunted right now. Oh, totally. I hope we get some listener stories. Maybe somebody's got something they want to share. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe if they you have, have any around with it. Yeah. Ouija board stories. Well, I know. We never there was them none in our us. house growing up um no. I, I was talking to my mom the other day and I was saying oh yeah like yeah it's definitely you know you that influenced us kids at least as girls especially um but all me and my brother and my sister like to be you know sort of into like different things like tarot and palm reading and stuff like that yeah um but like we never had a Ouija board in the house <laughs> yeah and I love board games, so you know that's fucking haunted shit when I won't touch it. <laughs> yeah, go to Toys R Us and buy, they probably, I don't know, maybe they sell. I know, They're no, it, like seriously, I've seen them on the shelves. It's just like, it seems yeah. so weird that it can be just sold at like Toys R Us, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right, well, we'll be right back. <laughs> we are back. Yes, Back in the New York groove. Oh, um, you know, I didn't tell you in our pre show that I did learn today just by being on George R. R. Martin's website. <laughs> He's hey, finally you know writing. <laughs> well, He's he still has more. been. Yes, you sound just like Pat. That's exactly what Pat said. Yes, well, they're he like, has... Yeah, he's doing this, he's doing this TV show, and I was like, Just Set him in a room without, like, just walls. Send him to prison. Make him right. Jeez. Okay, okay, okay. He knows. He knows. He has posts where he's like, yes, as I've said it a thousand times, I'm writing. And he literally did lock himself in a cabin for, like, a good part of 2021. But that's not what I was... Uh, wait, now you're going to make me forget what I was getting to. Because <sighs> I did learn a bit. I've always, I like going on his blog, especially when I was way into Game of Thrones when it was coming to an end, because like he has good recommendations for shows and stuff. Like that's how I found Outlander and The Expanse yeah. and other good shows and stuff. Um, but no, it was that he had partnered with the Meow Wolf people to help make the Meow Wolf art installation in Santa Fe. And I was like, wait. We went to Meow oh, Wolf that's cool. Omega Mart in Vegas, and it was this trippy thing that yeah. looked like a grocery store, but then, like, you went down a rabbit hole of, like, a million rooms that you were, like... Alien like government on... conspiracy. Right? And you, like, basically felt like you were on Aza because there was just, like, shit all over the walls and stuff everywhere. Yeah. It was crazy cool, but I was just, like, had no idea that he was even remotely a part of any of it but yeah because wow. he's from santa fe and he's big, okay 
community person there. Like I knew he had like bought a theater there and stuff. <laughs> Just an old one, but like, yeah, I was like, oh, we went to a Meow Wolf. I, okay. <laughs> yeah. That is so weird. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, that's things pretty are, interesting. Oh yeah, thing, that's part of my things I learned in the internet. The, uh, what did I call it? Segment. I did that like two episodes ago. Oh, I did have I have my death facts here. If you guys do want a fun Groves fact to start off my segment. Sure. <clears throat> oh God, my first one I had written down here was a human head remains conscious for around 20 seconds after being decapitated. <laughs> Yay. Yay. You can find a lot of dark things. Okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> oh, so was this one. Men who are hanged get a death erection known as rigor erectus. I think I've heard that one before. Really? I had. Yeah. <laughs> It'll live in my head like forever was... now why is the first thing that comes to my mind being like <laughs> some stupid tv show or movie where it's like a comedy and they're going and that one guy's job is to just break dudes penises back down after they die and for some reason that's oh like my so god great. and it's like a satire like break comedy. them <laughs> yeah and he's just like oh like after they get like hung and then he's like yeah the one guy the like i i'm buddies with the like guy the hanger guy there and the one guy hit like hangs them and then the other guy breaks their penis sounds like monty python or something because they're all like bring out your dead I'm not quite yeah. dead yet you know like it sounds so silly for some reason that's in my mind from something i saw and you think when they died because the blood flow and everything would then leave that this wouldn't be a problem anymore but rigor uh, mortis yeah i guess the blood does pool where it was when you died oh god well it pools with gravity so if you're standing up you, i'm not searching um, it my search history is fucked up <laughs> all right you want to hear about some haunted oh <laughs> that's a really good segue actually um at first it seemed like what i seemed to focus on or research first was after writing down a list of a, a few different um quote unquote haunted objects from a few short lists that i you know wasn't sure if they were going to be like good or not like i do remember one was like a doll and then it was like a like a princess diana themed like barbie and okay. it was apparently haunted with some like ancient spirit but then it was like it was like this list where they do a bunch of like you know it's a listicle they do a bunch of short blurbs and then there's nothing else about it and you google it and there's nothing else about it and you're like well okay i don't know how credible that is yeah so I, I couldn't bring that to you oh unfortunately but um i did end up picking things that ended up being mostly like furniture and speaking of wood mostly wood <laughs> <laughs> starting with uh the tallman bunk beds mostly. i what haunted oh. bunk beds <laughs> Okay, yes, yes. In 1987, the Tallman family moves into a new home in, it's spelled Horicon, but it seems to be pronounced Horican, Horican, <laughs> Wisconsin. Um, and that I did hear it spoken from one uh, source that I researched happened to be the uh, a Bailey Sarian video uh oh my know, god murders and makeup or whatever I was like yeah. oh she's got a video on it yes I will watch this I am I will definitely check you out <laughs> oh I'm so happy because yesterday she just came back from like <laughs> a three month break 
Um, oh. She had a lot Some going on. Some like, podcasts do that. Yeah. Well, it was like a huge, like, personal life change kind of thing she went through. Oh, and she fell into, like, a bit no. of a depression over it and stuff. So, yeah. Oh. Oh, good she's back then. That's good to yeah. hear. I mean, so it yeah, seems like she she's seems doing well. It. Yeah, and her videos are always so funny. So I'm happy she's back and feeling better because I missed no her shit. videos. Well, I remember telling my <clears throat> hairdresser who was like, well, like my friend because we bond about this kind of stuff too. She enjoys that yeah. and watches Bailey. And I was like telling her, I'm like, I don't know how she like, talks and does it the only time she ever mentioned it was when she was like literally drawing like these whiskers on her cheeks and was like oh it's a little bit hard to talk and like draw yeah. on my cheeks and I'm thinking like you're just talking like you're not even reading anything off any notes <laughs> like you're already, no, I like... saw like behind the scenes video once and she has <laughs> a computer and like a mic and everything that like goes through her notes and stuff like out of sight but they're like right that's a good idea her. okay yeah meanwhile I'm just like wait I want to zoom because I like to see you but then I like have a problem where I can't get them both up on the screen enough that to make it worth split screening <laughs> okay so back to the uh Tallman family in Horican <laughs> I guess uh they moved into this house which was a lovely single story home on Larrabee Street perfect for parents Alan and Debbie and their three kids they had a boy about seven years old and they had two younger girls um, who are around three and four years old, something like that. So it, it, they moved into a new house, which you might think would cause some issues, but it was actually quiet as they settled into their new home uh, until a few months later when they went to a thrift shop to look for some new furniture and some household knickknacks. Uh, so there they saw a cute brand new looking set of wooden bunk beds perfect for the girls Debbie thought so they bought them in February 1987 and by May were ready to move them up to the girls room so they did that but the next nine months they had increasingly dark energy and activity invade their home the kids had strange illnesses that would recur over and over they would go to the doctor and like get them prescriptions and whatever, but it just would keep coming back again or, you know, just way more than <laughs> even kids usually get sick. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then like, then it started doors would bang open and shut and they would hear disembodied voices and the kids would then complain of seeing a witch with red eyes that would appear to them that had long black hair and a reddish glow creepy yeah <laughs> so the little boy liked having the radio on at night and the presence would turn it off and fiddle with the dial in front of the boy and debbie was doing laundry one day when she heard her name being called over and over so like activity was kind of ramping up and it was making itself known <laughs> i would say that's so creepy no i know it's your classic haunting so the dad, Alan, got so pissed at the spirits frightening his kids, he lost his temper one day and shouted at them. And he yelled, pick on me, leave my kids alone. Like, that sounds Alan. so much like that. Um, the. Oh, my God. All I could think of was the haunting oh. in Connecticut. No, the Conjuring movie. The, the, the devil may be do it one. Yeah, where he's like, pick on me, leave. Well, okay because it, you know, it. I, it first finds yeah. a little boy I can't remember the names either but then like yeah. the brothers uh, like the sister it's the boyfriend. boy's sister's boyfriend yeah. yeah like takes it on that's so that's so nice better marry that fucking guy okay um <laughs> all right uh buh, 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 buh. So obviously it got worse after that. And one day Alan heard a voice coming from the garage. Uh, he had arrived home late from work around 2 a.m. And obviously he's very tired. And he hears this voice that sounds like a woman saying, come here, come here. And then he looks into the garage and he sees fire. 
everywhere like he it's on fire and then he rushes in but when he rushes into the garage there's no smoke no burnt remnants no ashes or anything like that oh okay <laughs> so the player's just gone just just playing with his little head yeah not cool creepy the kids frequently see the witch now and she says she's going to set fires and basically burn them all Classic. evil shit uh eventually they had their pastor come by and bless the place at one point but he said he did feel a demonic presence or the devil so like i don't i don't know if he particularly felt like he was up to the task but he definitely did come and bless the place but the stuff didn't stop <laughs> no <laughs> no <laughs> a relative that came to help debbie one night uh was turned from a lifelong skeptic to a reluctant believer when she saw a shadow person just hovering over the child's bed and then just it always is repeating these horrific things like kept saying you're dead to alan all the time so Weird. they fled <laughs> yeah they were like nope no thank you they fled the house. They dropped the bunk beds off at a dump, landfill, whatever, to be destroyed permanently. Or so, I hope. <laughs> um, I would have set them on fire. <laughs> Very full circle. <laughs> and then I would have said, you're dead. <laughs> I know. Don't love the fire thing. And it's weird how they were sure it didn't happen, like, just when they got to the house, but more when they got the beds. But they still left the house. Wow. But yeah, no thanks. No, no creepy witches for me either. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing was too that it was like such a small town that word got around. And then like I guess that became um, kind of a problem. Yeah, yeah, nobody wants to buy your house that's for sale. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's true um but even more so like people were trying to find the house i guess more blaming the house because um well like the family was obviously trying to keep the it all private because they have kids young kids trying to keep it out of the press and obviously they don't want to print the address but like there was like threats of arson and stuff like that you know people were going to burn down Oh, the house weird i know this point is a little weird to me too you don't hear it too often but it's like since the address address wasn't public the police <clears throat> were apparently fearing that a neighboring house might be mistakenly burned so then they released the address because the family was no longer there at the time so they did release the address and hopefully that I don't know. I don't think it ever burnt down. And it was featured on Unsolved Mysteries in October 1988. Um, the the house, no, yeah, it didn't burn down because the house now has new owners that do not report any activity. All right, that's my first haunted one, haunted bed. <laughs> that's so weird. Um, <laughs> I don't remember that one from Bailey Sarian. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I think she's been doing it for a while, hey? That's what... Yeah, um, there's a lot of videos. Like, saying, she's yeah. been doing it for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, that's what She also was just... Too. Everybody was sad in the comments because today she announced she's retired her theme song that was like, shana oh, really? shana 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 And it was just okay. her doing it, like, awkwardly every episode. Okay, but that's catchy. It's good. I know. <laughs> yeah, she's it? retired. She retired it. Yeah, <laughs> she's like going forward. I'm not going to be doing it. Oh. It was like rest in peace, Shana Shay. <laughs> and it had like 2019 to 2022 or something. It was like, uh... <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, stop. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, have you heard about uh, the Busby stoop chair? No. 
but I it's love so- the name. Must <laughs> be stupid chair. I like that name too. That's the first name I heard for it. So I did include the other names that it sometimes goes by, which is the dead man's chair or sometimes the chair of death. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Busby oh. Stoop. It just sounds so <laughs> so random consi- compared to the chair of death. True, 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 true. You'll find out. It has a bit to do with the name of the guy we're going to talk about here. This one takes... <laughs> Sorry, fruit fly. Right in my face. Like, almost hit my nose. <laughs> Fucker. Okay. You didn't see that, maybe. No. Maybe you did. Okay, anyway. I didn't see the bug. <laughs> no. It's too small. <laughs> Just me being an idiot. Okay. Um, uh, this happened in England in Thursk. <laughs> Thursk? I don't know. Sounds like it should be in Russia. But... <laughs> Long time ago, uh, it was this favorite chair at the local pub of a convicted murderer named Thomas Busby. He was some sort of striper, was the only thing I found about his job, which I was like, does that mean like a candy striper? Like when you work at like a hospital? I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. It was, <laughs> it was, it was the 1700s. So yeah, it's hard to say. Um, <laughs> he was convicted of the murder of Daniel Audie in 1702. Oh, as you'll see, it's the details are spotty. Daniel was either his father-in-law, his father, or his partner in crime, depending on what you read. Oh, that's <laughs> huge variations. <laughs> it, it is. It's almost like the stories just got passed down without any really good reporting over the years. <laughs> because it's like um okay so either they were in business together or they were in the in a family together and either way what seems clear is that they ended up not liking each other (laughs) and one of them did (laughs) yeah um so either they argued about the daughter slash wife elizabeth audie or they Otter are... slash wife is there. <laughs> I don't like I was that. like, how do I condense this? Because like, if Thomas Busby is the son or son-in-law, then they were arguing about Daniel Audie's daughter slash Thomas's wife. Okay. <sighs> anyway, Elizabeth Audie. Or she might not have even really been relevant and they just argued about their counterfeit coin business they had. (laughs) Either way, it's not, yeah, it's not like super relevant going forward to the story. But the main takeaway was that then Thomas Busby strangled Daniel Audie not long after they argued and Daniel had sat in Thomas's favorite chair. Oh, Oh, no. Not the chair that's got my ass print in it. <laughs> yeah, it's craziness. Okay, hang on. So Busby was sentenced to death by hanging, and on the way to the hanging, he requested that he stop by for one last pint at his favorite pub. They agreed, and Busby sat in his favorite chair for his one last pint. He cried out that anyone who dare sat in his favorite chair would soon die. <laughs> That's really why he wanted to stop there, to curse them all. And even another version has him just sitting in the chair, his favorite chair, when he was arrested. And that's when he made his curse proclamation. So who knows? (laughs) Right? (laughs) No one's sure of the details of this one. (laughs) I I would like to curse my couch that (laughs) I curse this couch. (laughs) <laughs> and then i'm gonna sell it on kijiji oh no oh, no no you know that haunted shit's for sale there we'll get to it again <laughs> there was there uh, used to be a, a podcast <laughs> i heard about i can't remember what it was oh it was just on um i think it was from good mythical morning 
or whatever yeah. the YouTubers I watched, they were talking about it and they're like, I think it was them. And they were saying there is a, a podcast or a YouTube or, or something that him and his brother literally just go to Kijiji and they just read ads for haunted things for sale. Mm. And that's all their show is. And I was like, I would watch it. Yes. Sounds familiar because there's so many out yeah. there. Yeah. And I've heard people like touch on it briefly in podcast segments. <laughs> <clears throat> and we will get to it a little bit. <laughs> Um, da, 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 da. but of course, no one really thought much of this cursed chair at first. Then an abnormal amount of death seemed to hang around the chair. During World War II, there was a base nearby called Skipton on Swale. <laughs> it's so <laughs> British. At <laughs> uh, Skipton on Swale, there was Canadian airmen who would come to the pub in Thursk. It was the closest place. Um, so the Canadian airmen that would come to visit the pub, they began to notice that those who sat in the chair did not come back again alive. Dun, dun, dun. Hmm. And two Royal Air Force pilots who sat in it drove back together from the pub, but crashed into a tree and died. Yeah. That's I mean, good soldiers but yeah <laughs> quite a few of them i guess i don't know uh there was a roofer who let his ass grace the cursed chair at that parish shortly after when the roof he was on collapsed okay that's not good no and there was actually a cleaning woman who just simply stumbled into it one day uh who later died of a brain tumor that's no fun um Again, it's one of those collection of deaths that you just can't say whether or not it would seem <laughs> if they do pertain yeah. to it. Uh, people would dare each other to sit in it, and uh, there was no no more word on whether all those people died. But there was one story that came out about, or later after the chair was put away, which we'll get to that an airman was being picked up by a driver, presumably from that nearby base um, mm. where all the Canadian airmen were coming from. And on their way home, <clears throat> the airmen needed to use the bathroom. So they stopped at the Busby Stoop Inn, which we'll get to why it's called that. But <laughs> the driver waited and waited for the airman to come back from the bathroom. But eventually he concluded that the guy must have gone. So he leaves. Uh, but the airman was apparently still there and eventually came out and got super pissed off at being abandoned there. So when he made his way back to the base, he grabbed a brick and smashed the driver's head in. Oh, jeez. Oh, got a little violent, he did. It eventually got moved to the basement where a delivery driver took a brief rest in it and he crashed his truck only apparently an hour later and did not survive that was apparently the last straw for the pub owner he had it moved to a nearby museum and the museum had it hung from the wall five feet up or about one and a half meters so that no more asses so touch it <laughs> Oops. Um, if you had happened to sit in it you might experience the following before you died Haunting experiences, extreme itching, paranoia, hearing things, confusion, items moving about the house, and or warnings appearing in mirror, mirrors and on walls. But yes, uh, just remember what Thomas Busby said, quote, may sudden death come to anyone who dares sit in my chair. <laughs> That's so weird. Like cursed chair. A cursed chair, yeah. You don't hear about that too often. It's always like, no, something more per. Well, yeah, it's, it's just like more a, personal. I don't know. It's a three hundred and twenty year old chair. So, oh yeah, I definitely right? didn't include it, but I think I read some things that people, like historian, uh, looked at it and thought that it might have been more modern than was claimed in the story of being from the mm -hmm. 1700s <laughs> which i'm always like damn it 
That's a very guys. old chair. It is, yeah. And it's something about the like chair nerdiness where they were like, didn't have the rolling thingies. <laughs> or yeah. something. Thank you, Antique Roadshow. <laughs> mm. Good Canadian I used to love television. watching that. Yeah. Is it? Oh, okay. I've called it Canadian, but I don't know if it is. Yeah. It's like old person TV. <laughs> I, I used to sometimes, I don't know, sometimes when you just want something on the background, you just want to hear people sure. suddenly find out that something that was passed down in their family is worth like $10,000 or something cool. And you're just like, yeah. I would watch it. And if it's not like other reality shows where they're all like planned, is that the word? no like, yeah then that's cool i like the real life stuff yeah I like pawn stars and stuff i hear is pretty fabricated you know? or like yeah what are those other ones where they go into like storage sheds and stuff like storage wars yeah i don't oh. like all that stuff because they talk about like how much they like when they do the scrappers or whatever they do the people that do like garage sales yeah, and they like hit up people, and they're like, "Oh, and uh, this thing is worth five hundred dollars, or I can sell, it, or I can sell it for five hundred dollars." And this person, they'll be like, "What mm-hmm. do you want for it?" And they'll be like, uh, four twenty-five." And they'll be like, "I'll give you two hundred. And the person's like, "No." And then they're like, "I'll give you four hundred for it." And they're like, "Or they'll, I'll give you three hundred for it." No, I'll give you three fifty for it. No. Yeah, and like oh, I'll give you three fifty five and throw in like whatever. Or I'll buy that one too Ugh. for a hundred bucks, and then you're like, oh no. my god! And they're like, this sale was a profit of five thousand dollars, and you're like, oh my god, fuck you! Like, just mm, that's kind of skewing the yeah. Yeah, I just oh, I hate like, that kind of results. stuff when they tell you what their profit is, and they're like, sweet, we can sell this for this and make a profit of this. Mm. It's like, oh my god. Like immediately, that's all yeah. they're thinking about. Like, yeah, it can be kind of gross. <laughs> and all they're doing is trying to haggle the person to not pay another twenty five dollars. Like that's gonna break their bank. Like, it's all like tax free shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hate that kind of stuff. Gross. I gotta get my notes. There we go. Burr, 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 burr. Oh, and then you're there. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so next, you might be familiar with the last one I was going to talk about, uh, which is referred to as the Dybbuk box. <laughs> um, I know the Dybbuk box. Yes. Uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about in detail anything on our trip last week because we wanted to get into the episode. <laughs> but yeah <laughs> I think well I mentioned this when I was talking about um my car shit so <laughs> yeah it's a it's apparently a well it's known as a very very haunted object if you haven't heard about it so it's a cool one that I was like okay well now that we've been there yeah maybe I will cover it so I'm a little bit about it and it turned out to be pretty interesting so yeah I don't know um so a little history in 2001 kevin manis was out visiting yard sales looking for items for his furniture restoration business in portland oregon and he says he purchased an old wine cabinet from the quote granddaughter of a recent recently that's not a word <laughs> recently recently <laughs> <sighs> From the granddaughter of a recently deceased Holocaust survivor named Havila, who escaped Nazi-occupied Poland. Uh, that quote was from this really great article uh, from Input Magazine website or whatever. Very informative. Um, so apparently their Holocaust survivor Havila had her parents, her siblings, like two brothers, one sister, husband, and her two sons were all killed in the Holocaust. And she and some other survivors fled to Spain to wait out the horrors of the war. 
Yeah, it's really rough. Yeah, sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, and like also it's like wow, it goes back a uh, some time. Um, she apparently immigrated to the United States where she lived to be 103. Oh, I meant to ask my mom when I talked to her. I, I, one of my great aunts lived to, I think 103, if not 103, at least 102. My great aunt Elsie. <laughs> oh, I wow. I was going to verify. Yeah, we're long lived in my family. My mom would say we're hardy peasant stock. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, she lived a long time. And when she came to the U.S., she had like three possessions on her, one of which was the box. This stupid okay. box. Yeah. Or to be more specific, it was just a wooden wine cabinet. Um, small enough to fit like on a desk. I yeah, when you say wine cabinet to me, I picture something bigger sometimes. Yeah, so. I was like, wine cabinet. Yeah. Two bottles of wine. It is, it's true. Like that's its original purpose, but to look at it, you might not even think that because yeah exactly it it couldn't hold that many not like a big wine rack or something it couldn't hold more yeah. than ugh, five six i don't know it depends but there was there's never wine in it as far as i know <laughs> um and it's i don't know it's beautiful but also i was like when i was thinking about how to describe it i was like well, it's not bigger than a bread box. And I was like, does anybody else even know what that means when I say bigger than a bread box? Because we always use that in 20, like not 20 questions, but basically that animal, mineral, yeah. or vegetable, or yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, if anyone doesn't know, like a bread box is some of the size of a microwave that's to like keep your bread more fresh if you're not going to keep it in a pantry or something. <laughs> My mom so, has a bread box and she actually uses that. I mean, my grandma had one or my great grandma, but yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just like, yeah, it's something that, that you would find maybe here in Canada and we just know yeah. what it is, but maybe not everybody knows what that is. <laughs> if you just yeah, a bread box. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh yeah, it's like my grave size. <laughs> yeah. Um. So with this this box and then when kevin manis was paying for his purchase the granddaughter remarked to him i see you've bought the dybbuk box she said her grandma had always kept it shut tight and out of reach because of a dybbuk a restless spirit that exists in jewish culture it is a malevolent spirit that can possess the living wah, wah. <laughs> no no no, but there is a Simpsons episode where they keep trying to sell him something and it's like, it comes with a free Froger. That's good. But the Froger is also cursed. That's bad. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. <laughs> um, so she sold it to him with a warning. You must never open it or evil things will happen. So he immediately started restoring it to give to his mother as a birthday present. <laughs> he opened it and took it apart. I mean, yeah, he's like, I'm going to give this to my mom. Don't worry. It's going to be great. <laughs> Curse you, mom. And when he opened it, he found some things inside. It had two U.S. wheat pennies, which when I looked them up, they're also called Lincoln pennies for the, you know, they have Lincoln on one side, uh, wheat on the other. Now we both okay. mentioned Lincoln. Okay. <laughs> America, but <laughs> so two Thank you, pennies. Lincoln. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> These were dating back though to like 1925, 1928. So pretty old pennies. Um, two locks of hair, a dried rosebud, a four-legged candle sit stick, sorry, and a golden wine chalice or cup. Chalice just sounds fun. And <laughs> a granite sculpture on which the word shalom is inscribed. So I have all that shit. Okay. In there. I don't remember learning any of that when we went to the exhibit. No, they didn't will. really teach you much about specific things. It was very quick. And we wouldn't have maybe even retained it anyway. We were so hungry. 
but <laughs> no. you were basically starving. We were basically <laughs> competing in like a famine, like Hunger unintentionally. <laughs> we talked like we were terrible. It was, I mean, what we got there at three and we left at like 10 30 so it was like seven and a half hours oh god 10 30 like 11 it's just a little bit of unintentional fasting yeah. <laughs> oh. um so on the back of the cabinet oh fucking fruit fly i got him i got him okay i'm so sorry i will edit that out um it reminds me, I was watching on YouTube the critical role people that play D&D &D, and one time there was like a fly and then somebody was like, clap above it! And one guy goes, Phew! and then it was like, boom! And it was barely dead. And I was like, what the fuck? I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> oh shit, I'm too far. Okay. So, I do remember seeing this. On the back of the cabinet is an inscription of the Shema. Should have looked up how to properly pronounce that, but the Shema or Shema Yisrael is a Jewish prayer that serves as a centerpiece of the morning and evening Jewish prayer services. Its first verse encapsulates the monotheistic essence of Jew Judaism. Judaism. Quote here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, found in Deuteronomy. That was a quote from Wikipedia. Okay, I think I remember that being like in the back too. Yeah, a big long, you know, verse that you can't read because it's in Hebrew or whatever. But yeah, you're like, okay, there's something pretty special in the back yeah. of that. Yeah. Um, and then Kevin Manis did indeed give the box to his mother um they said on halloween i don't know if that is her birthday because he was going to give it to her on her birthday but apparently to give it to his mother and then she did an interview with tv's paranormal witness in 2012 where she describes feeling a cold breeze coming from inside the cabinet and also felt pure evil and then basically instantly had a stroke oh that's terrible yeah so that's not great um and probably helped with it helped i don't know maybe increased the folklore around it or it's infamy <laughs> but over yeah. the next two years yeah kevin manis and his family experienced misfortune and paranormal activity uh his sister would get spooked each time the doors of it would open and shut out of the blue. She would just witness it opening. Um, I mean, that would be creepy, yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, I, anytime I hear a weird noise in my house, if I can't explain it by someone being home or an animal, it's like, oh, is that just a house noise? Hopefully. <laughs> right? Ah. Uh. Fenrir, Fen, if Fenrir is not freaking out, it's nothing to worry about. That is the nice feeling about having a big dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, or an animal, because they're just very in tune. Yeah. You know, they can tell, they can hear, like, my uh, old roommate, her cat, when I used to be home and she'd go to come home, like, yeah. her cat used to hear her like walking the sidewalk could tell it was her and would like go to the front door and wait Aww. for her and then she said that her that the same cat would do the <laughs> same thing she's like yeah you pull into the driveway and the cat can hear you pull into the driveway and i have a detached garage mm. it's like through my yard and everything and the right. cat would hear me pull into the driveway and she'd go wait at the side door for me to come in <laughs> and stuff yeah that is the best yeah. feeling like there's nothing like getting home you can have like i can get home and like nine times out of ten they're both occupied the human members of the household with tv or whatever but then yeah. like the dog will be just like oh mom's home and he'll, he'll hear my car because then like if he's outside he'll be like literally like just oh like howling to get let in and if he's not yeah. then he just he just gallops over to me. There's no other word for it, but he gallops over to me when I get home. And yeah. I'm just like, aw. Sometimes it's funny because he'll stop and grab his toy on the way. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. They're so cute. But yeah, they can just, oh man, that's crazy. If like 
it's not even the car pulling in but just the steps you're like Whoa. yeah she was like tell <laughs> walking up to the house that it was like her like yeah Pardon crazy me. that is that is uh pretty impressive oh yeah so the dybbuk box his uh manis his brother and sister-in-law would both complain of a strange odor coming from the box which was apparently like a mixture of jasmine with a whiff of cat urine <laughs> so i guess well, ammonia ew <laughs> so gross and yeah <laughs> Manus and his siblings suffered from recurring nightmares of an old woman with sunken eyes. Ew, sounds like the witch in the first, first story. story. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wait, with the witch? Okay. Um, but yeah, just in a tragic twist, a store employee's brother died by suicide not long after knocking the box off a shelf. And his brother, the store employee, killed himself not too many years later. So yeah. that's just very sad. And that's just people that just worked in the place that housed it, if we're to understand that correctly. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and then as I said, in my own words, Kevin decided to foist it off on his girlfriend. <laughs> who other other sources described it as giving it to her but i was like come on <laughs> yeah <I> want that. <laughs> I mean. like, hell no <laughs> take that shit back and around that time he started seeing shadow people so he listed it on ebay as a dybbuk box along with a lengthy description see almost all of my notes now <laughs> um and as i've noted in recent years it's become quite popular to sell your haunted things on there especially like dolls and stuff <laughs> yeah as we've i think at least talked about in like the cursed episode episode three which was now we're kind yeah. of revisiting yeah um, and we will revisit that because I've got something to add at the end that we talked about. Oh, okay. Yeah. Something we saw in Vegas. Um, <laughs> so you can find haunted dolls on Etsy and eBay. You can find Dybbuk boxes on Etsy and eBay and the Dybbuk box store website, which is another site i have found and i'm sure it will live on my <laughs> history forever <Store> website. <laughs> and they're all varying on authenticity i am sure but <laughs> i loved the dybbuk box website it was actually quite i felt like a, i don't know i felt like it was it was a good source it had more information than i thought it would <laughs> to be honest but um, it describes the boxes as, quote, barriers between the living world and any force that should not be here. In other words, they are not merely vessels, but entrapments for metaphysical energies that should not exist in our living world. I mean, yeah, that sounds like what I've heard of them. But you do hear mostly about the negative ones. But uh, I mean, maybe there's more. So some might be like younger than others these spirits or like more peaceful but some are oh, definitely okay. <laughs> well maybe i mean I, that's i was yeah that's kind of what i was trying to say i guess it's like you only hear about the bad ones but like maybe if it just means like it's a box that holds a spirit maybe it's kind of like when you think about a ghost they could maybe be a, a good one or a bad one with bad intentions i don't know oh okay that makes sense i think that's what it is saying um but definitely some would be negative when you consider the fact that they appear to be the results of either spells gone wrong or in some extreme cases like occult magic or rituals where even murder can be involved in trapping the spirit in the box wow Ugh. yeah 
interestingly, I thought they're historically associated with Judaic traditions or Jewish mysticism, which I love the word mysticism. So good. <laughs> I should use it more often. Um, <laughs> she's there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it can be found in many cultures in different variations and similar beliefs. All history and cultures are kind of intertwined in, in my experience. And they've discovered sometimes the exact same things around the world that happen simultaneously and independently. So I don't know. I think it can be something that might be true of different cultures. It does seem to have history in different cultures. So yeah. It's cool, but also creepy. Um, many of the boxes are sealed with wax and filled with possible various mementos, one might say, like, quote, hair, bones, burnt ashes, personal belongings, handwritten messages, photos, appeasements, and offerings. Which I don't know if we talked about on here, but remember when we went into the room with Peggy the doll, our tour guide had asked us if we had heard anything. He was waiting for us in the room with Peggy the doll and we were in the antechamber, whatever they called it, listening to the little spiel about Peggy. And he was like, did you oh, guys yeah. hear that? Yeah, he said that something had moved in one of the boxes where they had a bunch of like offerings and stuff like coins and rings and stuff. He was like, something just like flew off like into the side of that glass box and like he was like I don't know sometimes when I'm in here with Peggy alone shit happens and I was like oh but I was like I did not hear it I wasn't paying attention because no I didn't hear it were, either well no and like you probably wouldn't unless you were like a tour guide in the other room because you were in we were in that other room like you were listening to a video where Zach was talking oh. about the or it was just before the Dybbuk box I guess because they both had special little rooms before them yeah yeah mm. i don't know it's just so cool i wish i could have heard it <laughs> yeah L little paranormal activity um uh, oh weirdly enough sometimes apparently the dibic boxes can be incorporated with tarot card readings which I don't know, it just sounds like a bad idea. Okay, that sounds weird. Yeah, I didn't really understand that. They didn't really go into depth, but like, I don't know. I don't know why you'd want to do that when, yeah, readings that can be kind of like, yeah, divining in a way. Weird. Um, but something I didn't know was sometimes like maybe a Dybbuk box might have been used after a death to contain like an energetic spirit that's bothering someone or haunting somewhere. I don't know. I just, I guess you hear about them having bad spirits in them, but that you might not think that like, oh, maybe like, maybe it was just like a bad ghost or something. And then like, or like, you know, a negative spirit that, that lingered too long and then someone like just traps it like you're know, like maybe it's yeah. not a demon yeah i don't know could be anything and some might say their kind of paranormal cousin is the jinn which can date back to like pre-islamic culture they're even mentioned in the quran and that's the spirit that can be a negative energy and can inhabit or influence people they can also appear as animals or humans. And another word for jinn is genie, who are also kept in a vessel like a lamp or a bottle, which is kind of interesting mm -hmm. when, yeah, think about the vessel side. Um, and then there's just, they had a little bit more about people who have owned the Dybbuk box besides Zach Baggins, owner of the Haunted yeah. Museum. <laughs> um, and that Kevin Manis guy we talked about. But yeah, another one was Jason Huxton, and he wrote a book about the Dybbuk box. He was afraid to publicize the story. Um, that doesn't make sense, that sentence. Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> he wrote a book about the Dybbuk box. Um, 
he was a bit of a character too though he was the director of the museum of osteopathic medicine in kirksville missouri and an expert in american antiques and artifacts of ancient origin so he was apparently fascinated with the cabinet he also had many experiences when he owned it such as choking sensations and bleeding from the eyes no i'm not a fan of that <laughs> yeah and he had similar nightmares with uh, figures with sunken eyes um also to note he and kevin manis served as production consultants on sam raimi's 2012 movie the possession which was about the tippet box i guess i would have to watch it again <laughs> i think i saw it i know i felt the same way i was like i watch a lot of horror so i i, I think i like sam raimi he does some good horror movies yeah. i feel like yeah um so also weird things happened on set of that movie the director ole or I don't know how to say his name, Ole Bernadal recalled. A neon light exploded above his head, even though it had been unlit at the time. And five days after shooting wrapped, a fire destroyed all the, all the props, a mysterious fire. <laughs> In 2016, Huxton sold the box to Zach Baggins and he put it in the haunted museum. And so as seen on the clips in the tour and on Ghost Adventures Quarantine, Zach opens the box at one point, uh, saying he heard it say Kevin, then evil, then it used the voice of a child. That's when he touches the box, just as his friend Post Malone, the famous face tattooed singer, reaches out and touches his shoulder. And that's when Post believed he was cursed because during the months that followed after, he had to make an emergency landing on a private plane. Um, I mean, yes, it sounds like woo, 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 baby, but like it sounded like they were going to crash. So that that's pretty serious. Yeah. Yeah. And his San Fernando Valley home was broken into and he had a car crash. Yeah. Um, it's quite a few things which are sh kind of shitty so I can understand why he was a little freaked out and I know he does believe in that stuff I did watch the I, they show a clip of the Joe Rogan episode where he is talking about that and I, I have watched the whole thing because I kind of like Post Malone so <laughs> he's yeah. kind of open-minded so I like that um, I like yeah, his no. music the songs like I hear when I first yeah. heard a song on the radio and it like literally updated and then it said it was Post Malone I was like this is Post Malone singing like, right because i'm like this I thought song? he was like a, a rap like a complete yeah rapper like hardcore rapper or something probably because of his yeah. look and you know yeah judge a book ways but i was just like i yeah. really like this song and then they started like playing his songs on i think it's like on sonic sometimes and i'm just like <gasps> everyone like, i've heard i'm just like yeah i like this like yeah yeah yeah, yeah they yeah. played it one on the radio uh in the last year or two that like i think it's like that you're my sunflower is that one that's a good one i don't know the only one that's coming to my mind uh, is like circles probably that's my yes. favorite one i yeah, like that I like one that too one. although i can't think of it right now um so just to finish up basically here um the last two owners but lastly what do they have here the two owners manis and huxton have been noted to have a bit of a rivalry so the two owners before Zach. Huxton said that Manus never finishes anything. It wouldn't have got the movie made or a book done. <laughs> so I don't I don't know. Because he wrote a book on it. He thought the other guy wasn't good enough. Um he even went so far in his book as to call Kevin Manus out saying, Is the story really true? And even refers to some Facebook posts Manus made claiming it's a made-up story which is less fun, but also does bring up a bit of an interesting point. What if he did make up the story, like the backstory of the Dybbuk box? And maybe in doing so, did he sort of make the box what it was? Yeah, we'll probably um, never know. <laughs> no, probably not. I like, I've never heard that part before though. Um, so this was, this is what 
he, I guess, said like the other side of it, you know, Manus says he really got the box off an attorney, you know, rather than a Holocaust survivor. So this is perhaps the case, but that it was a low period in his life. Uh, he said he didn't intentionally channel anything into it except his prayers for himself and for forgiveness. But did this specifically on a special Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur, uh, which was apparently also known as the Day of Atonement. I'd heard of Yom Kippur, <laughs> but yeah, Day of Atonement sounds very official. Mm -hmm. um, so just maybe he had enough dark energy to create some sort of a in my opinion maybe like a talpa which are kind of one of those ones that like you think into existence a talpa is a quote concept in theosophy mysticism and the paranormal of an object or being that is created through spiritual and mental powers i mean oh, okay either way the if the rest of the story is true there are 10 more boxes or 10 boxes in total i guess hidden around the globe manis said that the story was that havila and the other holocaust survivors summoned an evil spirit to help the jews fight against the nazis but that they couldn't control it i like that story i think it makes them sound like superheroes i don't know <laughs> but also because superheroes make bad decisions and unleash things that they shouldn't because yeah. yeah um havala believed it caused some of the 20th century's greatest disasters including the korean war that's why it had to be captured and separated zach baggins has two the main one the big one that we saw in the main box and one little one like the other nine are and manis yeah. has said What's that? The little one was so nice. Oh, I know. it looked like a little jewelry box, like so beautiful. I know. I thought, well, what the fuck? They're just these beautiful things. Like even the main one is like, I don't know if I wrote it down here, but apparently like, someone made the extra shell of it where it's like encased in this gold inlaid wood. You're like, oh, I don't yeah. care if that wards off spirit. It's just beautiful. <laughs> um. But yeah, apparently there are 10 in total and Manus had said that he had six and that two are lost. And the last is just mostly what Zach had to say in regards to um, this, this article because the, the author did contact him and wondered about the claims about whether it was true or not. And Zach said, since owning the Dybbuk box, there have been countless documented experiences people have had with it not just for myself, but my museum staff, my fellow crew members, visitors, and most notably Post Malone. He also claims that multiple guests have been severely affected in the Dybbuk box room in his museum, some of them escorted out on a stretcher by EMT personnel. No word on whether they just needed a granola bar. <laughs> I know, I was just gonna say, like, <laughs> like i when the one lady was like i don't feel so good and it feels like the floor is moving and i'm like honey like oh, i've been feeling like that since true. we got into this place and that's why when we were like in the room <laughs> and they were like going through the things i was like if we if either of us pass out we just needed a granola bar and nobody would give us one because y'all apparently don't have food and you can't even give us one in an emergency or something. So we're possibly in the next two hours of our like <laughs> museum thing. We're going to pass out at any moment. And just so you know, you don't need to call an ambulance. You just need to give us a fucking granola bar. <laughs> like, oh. Don't operate like that. You're in the trenches now. There's no food there. <laughs> oh, oh. Even the guides seemed a little exhausted by the end of the day. I saw our yeah. guy leave for the end of the night and I was like, oh, he was good, but he seems tired. And the other guy was like, yeah, they work hard. <laughs> yeah, I would hate to do the same spiel over and oh, over totally. and over. Like, I mean, we all do it in, at our own jobs in one way or another. <laughs> but being a tour guide is like next level, I feel like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because you literally have like a script that you like have to follow every two yeah. hours exactly the same you can't like, really it's a lot. Yeah. yeah you can't really <laughs> divert from that 
Um, oh yeah, so what blah, 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 paragraph. Oh yeah, so Zach said some of them have been escorted out by EMT. I don't believe this to be the full truth, he writes in response to what Manus told me about making the story up. He cites some of the things that have befallen Manus in the past week, which Manus has also shared with him. I think there is so much more to the Dybbuk box, and regardless of its origins, it's very much cursed and evil, Baggins con continues. I'm not surprised that more controversy and conflict keep arising from it. The Dybbuk box has always raised questions and intrigue, and this adds to its narrative. The Dybbuk box has been the focus of books, a major motion picture, and TV shows, Baggin writes in the conclusion of his email. There is more to this powerful, cursed item. Its story is still being told. And that's all I have on that one. Very yeah. good. Oh. So many cursed objects. It is, and the other one we're, I, we didn't really get to, but while we were at the Zach Baggin Museums, museums <laughs> that would sound like squirrely dan from letter kenny just adding s's on everything <laughs> sashimis sushis no but when we were there right when we were about to leave uh, it's like right before the gift shop because i remember i was like kelsey come look at this they had the picture that was um like the sequel or the prequel to one of the cursed pictures i talked about in episode three the hands resist yeah. him and it yeah it was it was good i enjoyed it i was like oh my god i know this artist and it's like cool because in the one we talked about in episode three it's like the creepy little boy and the little doll girl looking in on this weird store yeah and then in this picture they were like looking out that's what i was trying to um upload to the drive for you was that there was like like four in the the artist apparently did a series of about four, but I had never realized that. And I don't think I ever would if I hadn't stopped to read that damn picture description. <laughs> yeah, just looking at what it says on like the thing on the website, it says yeah. like the last one was just done like last year in the series. Ooh, okay, I yeah. didn't notice that. Yeah, I didn't notice that at all. Yeah, it's like nice. on the... Maybe we, well, maybe we can put like a link to it or something and we'll try but yeah they're creepy yeah. pictures I like them <laughs> they were yeah commissioned by a private collector resistance at the threshold and threshold of revelation depict the boy and the doll as having progressed the doll into a real girl and the boy into an old man and the right. prequel is the one that we saw the hands in Bentham also commissioned depicts the artist as a boy with the original paintings characters viewed from behind the glass door the series ends with what remains in 2021 which just looks like a burnt fireplace that's all anything yeah. remained in 2021 but, but the no, one but, yeah. that we saw at the baggins yeah. museum was only painted in 2017 oh okay okay, yeah. okay. that would be the original of that the original painting. one was in 1972 the hands the resist him okay i think that's, yeah. that would have been the one i talked about where like yeah people were like okay the the kids thought it was haunted because they saw the little girl pointing like a gun at the little boy and stuff Oops, yeah. so creepy. Uh, and on that note um thank you for listening you guys yes. i want to mention patreon again because for some that don't know what the fuck Patreon is, uh, like my dear mother, um, <laughs> you can Ooh, find us. Calls out. <laughs> but not really because I love her because she listens. Um, but no, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a way to donate to, you know, some of your, your favorite, uh, what are we? Artists? Podcasts? Uh, <laughs> content creators that content were, creators is that it. youtube people use and stuff um yeah. but you can go to so it's like yeah you get bo monthly bonus episodes is what you get from us and yeah. yeah you give us a couple bucks a month or whatever and we fucking appreciate it so the easiest way would be like patreon.com slash castles and cryptids or we have a link tree link in our 
episode description, also in our Instagram yep. bio. And mm-hmm. also you can find it on our website and anywhere it says join the Illuminati. That is our <laughs> Patreon group. Yes. We want to be a fun cult group. No, I just like the name. <laughs> yeah. And we have lots of episodes. Anxiety. There's 10 full like Patreon episodes already. Right. And all of We've them are doing... at least an hour long. Most of them oh, are yeah. like the length of our regular <laughs> episodes. Um, yeah, so like one two extra to bonus three hours. one a month, and then we yeah. started doing extra video episodes a month too. So yeah, it's a it's a plethora of content. So we'll hope to see you guys there too. But yeah, thank yes. you for listening. <laughs> oh, and we're gonna yes. post a little a Vegas video of all the highlights from that shit. So you can check that one out. Um, and Kelsey did electrocute me at the mob museum. So that will be there. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> With that nice, nice guy that videotaped it for us. He very helped nice. us. He was very friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then, All right. oh, uh, uh, what are we doing nope. next week? Um, or, next what week are we is... recording in a couple days? Next week is spring break crimes because it's still yeah. March and this is my fucking birthday episode, baby. I guess <laughs> it comes up close to my birthday. Yeah. <laughs> I will take it. And we love you and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>